Welcome to Slash Forward. Is Just Before Dawn one of the most terrifying underrated backwoods slashers ever made? I'll leave that judgment up to you, but with an amazing amount of restraint in its slow revelation of disturbing background details, it's certainly way better than any low-budget slasher has the right to be. And it starts when we open on an ominous blood-red landscape at just before sunrise. We then transport to a quaint little cabin church where Uncle Ty shows his nephew Vachel how to bless an offering properly. In this case, a fine two-point buck. The ceremony is shit upon by a merry creepster who Vachel never catches sight of, which is why he joyfully leaves Uncle Ty to his tomfoolery. He hops out, expecting to find a man crouched over with trousers around ankles, but he finds nothing to his disappointment. It appears as though Vachel did not set the brakes on the truck, and he is horrified at the trouble he'll be in. Like a vengeful spirit alighting upon our realm to fulfill that fear, our friend from the hole arrives to give Vachel a little gentleman's caress before his egg basket is hewn in twain. His screams attract his uncle's attention, and he gazes briefly upon the foul behemoth now presenting as Vachel before dashing off. Somewhere down the mountain, we find Warren and the gang rolling in their RV, thumping some blonde and getting absolutely torqued over the idea of climbing all over Mother Nature's granite face. But their emotional directions become confusingly associated with death. Warren goes out to check on the little guy but finds no carcass at the scene, so he presumes the animal survived and then continues on with Jonathan blowing his lucky whistle to help clear the way. Elsewhere, something's riling up Agatha and intruding upon the serenity of forest ranger Roy McLean. He goes out to check and finds it likely to have been the approach of the rowdy young campers. This is a surprise to him because there ain't no campgrounds up yonder. Warren waves a land deed in his face and insists that he's a seasoned woodsman. If they won't heed his warnings of likely death, he at least wants to be able to check up on them. Silver Lake. But Jonathan gives him a false destination so they can all be alone. They continue on until Daniel sees something worth stopping for with his keen eye, although he admits that he doesn't know what it was, although he does suspect it was a random person. A branch snap draws Warren's attention toward the underbrush. He carefully pulls back a branch and they wait patiently, but their patience yields no results. <laughs> until this old bastard pops out and starts talking about some demons coming to get him. But they have a camping schedule to keep too, so they suggest he stick to the road and maintain a positive mindset regarding his survival into the future. Your boy is sauce to the gills, so it's hard to take him seriously. Regardless, Constance is not at peace with this decision. But then the demon hitches a ride on the camper, giving old Ty a new lease on life. They eventually split off deep into Hilljack territory, where they continue driving until the terrain no longer allows it. At that point, they pack up and hoof it to the falls, an absolutely beautiful little echo chamber that's perfect for dicking around. Just beyond this is a flat spot that would make for a good camp. Warren charges them with setting up the tents while he and Jonathan go back to the camper to get the rest of their stuff. He takes a moment to say goodbye to his lady, but she's unsettled about the decision to keep the ranger in the dark. She has some deeply foreboding negative feelings, but they're in a pristine wilderness in God's country, and Warren owns the land, so what could possibly be the concern. Night falls before the boys return. The campers are spooked by some unseen animal just outside the light of the fire. That sure seems to move around like a person. Megan begins to get shrill, so you know it's getting tense. Then the boys nearly get stabbed for the sake of a couple of laughs, and that's about all they bring to the table as someone busted into the RV and cleared out most of their supplies. I am also wondering why there's no follow-up on this. This is all becoming too much for Connie, for whom the act of climbing rocks is sacrosanct. In the morning, we learn that what got to Connie was the realization that she was helpless in the face of danger, and that isn't how she sees herself. But they're distracted from this by a beautiful beautiful song floating in the air. They trace it back to its source and find a shy little recluse songstress who skedaddles as soon as they hail her. But no matter, they've got rocks to conquer. After a bit, they find the rope bridge, which is not much more than a slack line with training wheels. Warren insists it's perfectly safe and nearly foolproof, and shows them how to go about it while recommending they refrain from hot dogging. They're fairly eager to reach the other side, and in the rush, Daniel nearly loses his ass. They're now at a new water feature, but on the top side. Seeking to reach the spring below, it's now Jonathan's turn to lose his ass as he tumbles down the incline. With no concern for their appendages, the rest of them have great fun risking life and limb for the sake of putting in a minimal effort. John and Megan take to the water like a pair 
of sensual fish. So Connie encourages the others to give them some privacy. John John plays a little goof on his lady. You know how they like to imagine you're dead. Our little woodland nymph looks on in curious horror as the big dog takes a dip from beyond the falls. And he must have a set of lungs on him. Big, beautiful lungs, because we never see him surface. After John spends some more time under, he reaches up to give Megan a forbidden hello, running his arm up her ass crack, which she likes. And she likes it. Except she's shaken to see her boo is actually on the shore at that very moment. She rushes over, screaming that someone was feeling her up in the water. But since no one ever breaches the surface, Jonathan reminds her that it was him. He had been feeling her up in the water, silly goose. I know what you're thinking, but this was just a different time. Back at McLean's, he's still working on that one tree when Agatha starts back up again. He goes out and finds Ty in the trough, as usual. But not as usual, he's here to report a murder. But a murder by a demon. A massive spirit of the mountain, poised to upon those kids, and they have no idea what's coming. They drive this home for us with their late night coffee parties, jazz dancing, and partner sharing. Megan chooses to assert herself as the most sexually desirable female partner, prompting Connie to get those hips moving in a suggestive rotation, while underlit by the orange glow of the fire. But the party comes to a crashing halt. The hill folk have arrived to assert their land rights. Pa has no patience for deeds and no tolerance for music. Why, it's enough to raise the devil, which is not just a turn of phrase for him. And this is accentuated when they back away slowly into the woods. Meanwhile, McLean arrives at Silver Lake, the location they said they'd be at, but finds no evidence of any camping, which we knew to expect. He's not one to let things go, so against his own best judgment, he carries on. In the morning, Megan believes that a raccoon made off with some of her makeup, so she sends Jonathan into the woods to see if he can find any among the fresh scat. But what he discovers is that it was confiscated by their friend, who he comes to know as Mary Cat Logan. She was somewhat titillated to observe their activity in the water. Jonathan does rebuff her advances, but for the sake of Pa Logan's blood pressure, not because of Megan. He's too good of a guy, though, and couldn't live with himself if he left the mountains knowing she was still upset. So he follows her out and, assuming she's afraid of heights, tries to demonstrate his masculine value by showing her how easy it is to use the bridge. But in so doing, he discovers the true cause of her unverbalized hesitancy. His attempts at cordial conversation are not appreciated, and as he begins to distance himself from his dirty companion, the ropes that comprise the entire structure of the bridge are cut. This leaves him dangling in the water like a dingleberry, desperately blowing his whistle for attention. It carries on the breeze and nearly interrupts the girl's wilderness glow up, but not quite. As a result, Jonathan is stuck trying to wet climb an unknotted rope, which, not sure if you've had to try that, but is a difficulty of 11. He struggles to make it to the top, but digs deep beyond his despair and finds the strength within to claw his way out and earn another chance at life, only to be welcome to take a dip back in the water. But whose foot and how he crossed over are questions we'll have to seek answers to later on. Elsewhere, Daniel finds a picturesque graveyard adjacent to a building that we've come to know intimately. He ventures in to see if there are any sweet shots in there and the lighting is just flawless. He and Megan find each other, but they don't find Vachel partially due to being driven out by the stench, and so they kind of found Vachel. Down in the rapids, Warren's playing like a grizzly bear to impress his lady, but their randy makeout sesh is interrupted when the J-man's body comes rolling in on him. Due to Warren's lack of CPR knowledge, his body is well-loved, but remains unresuscitated. Warren tries to keep an optimistic outlook here, insisting that he must have had an accident, but Connie is not buying it. Back at the photo shoot, Megan's making herself into the most lovely and alluring corpse in the yard. They hear some noises nearby and assume it's Jonathan pranking them, so they counter-prank him with some salacious foreplay. But with his glasses missing, Daniel has lost all clarity of detail and sense of proportion, allowing this big bitch to walk right up on him. And when Daniel is forcefully penetrated, Megan finds herself mildly perturbed. She runs into the church and then relaxes, knowing that she is now safe. Demons can't enter hollowed grounds. Daniel bleeds out slowly in the front yard, and as Megan observes the simple oaf outside, another one casually strolls up behind her, answering some of our continuity questions. Realizing now that she is surrounded from two sides, she has no choice but to wait and see what comes of it. Connie and Warren arrive back at the campsite. They're dead and make a hasty assessment based on the empty tents and the high likelihood that they have, indeed, raised the devil. With very few options available, they decide to go find Ma and Pa to see if they can provide any help. It doesn't take long for them to come upon their ass. 
and find them creeping around the corner of their shanty. Pa seems to always be locked and loaded. They insist on knowing what he was getting at earlier, but they're not prone to cooperate. Although Mary Cat does find their big city ways alluring. They hang around till nightfall just in case their friends happen to return, but they don't. And to make it worse, Warren remembers that John had the keys to the RV. Putting on a clinic of clear thinking, he tells Connie to hang back for when the others arrive while he goes to get the keys. He'll get Jonathan's whistle and sound off if he gets lost. A perfect plan to keep everyone safe. When he gets to the riverbank, the body is no longer there. He ventures out by the light of his lantern and does eventually find him. A new sadness washes over him when he realizes John's not pranking. There is no mistaking the chilly touch of death, and so he leaves this place empty handed. McLean eventually stumbles upon the Logan residence. Paul claims to have seen nothing, but Mary Cat bursts out to share her wisdom. In the ensuing argument, we hear the parents are remaining neutral due to the proscription against turning on one's kin. No longer willing to accept her brother's behavior, she breaks free and catches up with McLean to guide him to the camp. While at that very camp, Connie hears the call of the whistle and attempts to lead Warren back to her just as he said. When he doesn't respond or appear, she becomes upset by the thought that he might be playing games, given all the murder. Thankfully, Warren's good name is preserved. She dashes off into the woods and climbs an old birch tree, correctly assuming these suckers can't follow her up. Meanwhile, McLean and Mary Cat run across Warren, who's taken a wild-eyed jog through the woods. There is some concern for Connie's safety given the events that have transpired, and they better hurry, because while he's unable to climb, he's real good at chopping. He eventually fells the tree and playfully swats at Connie's fanny while whistling all the way. When he rears up for the kill swat, the crack of a rifle sounds off off three times, causing him to fall lovingly into a big spoon configuration. Warren very delicately pulls her out of her trance. After a brief argument about whether or not McLean knew of the danger, and he claims he didn't, he suggests they get down the mountain, and he leaves them despite Warren's continued delusion that his friends are still alive. But under the presumption that the killing is done for the night, they take their time packing up their shit. I mean, a legit Coleman Sterno set is awfully pricey. While he was doing that, Connie was busy losing her damn mind, coming out all made up and acting like there was romance in the air. Then a sudden dip in the ambient sounds puts them on high alert, and Sternos be damned, Warren makes new plans for an immediate retreat to the RV when the unknown twin pops out and sticks him. Connie then hits her limit on feeling helpless in the woods and starts throwing bows. He puts her in a bear hug and slowly squeezes her guts out, but she still has some fight left in her. But that is his go-to move, so he takes the face position and continues contracting. She thrashes from every angle as Warren looks on defeated. Then, with a flash of inspiration, she crams her fist up to the elbow down his slimy gullet. She holds it there until she's sure the light has gone out. Afterwards, she stands in her power and faces down Mary Cat, who doesn't want any of that smoke, and then comforts her bruised and broken man as the dawn sun rises above the tree line. The obvious lesson here, and I hope I don't have to tell you this, is to maintain an awareness of your surroundings and please take murder seriously. You don't want to get caught out after having all the signs laid out before you. Next, keep it in the family by watching one of the best remakes ever that also stands on its own as a great movie. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.